the area of international relations and peacekeeping, all of us working on peacekeeping, we felt that this, this field, I mean, international peace and security should be, uh, and peacekeeping uh, as part of subset of that, should really be uh, a field where there was a lot of scrutiny uh, by different uh, IR theories, as it is uh, one of the more important um, subsets of international relations. Um, however, at least historically, that hadn't been the case. In the more recent years, though, there has been a lot more uh, research coming out with uh, explicit um, different theoretical uh, perspectives on peacekeeping, and we thought it could be very helpful uh, both to, to try to have a look at how different international relations theories could be applied to peacekeeping, as well as see how um, peacekeeping as an empirical field could bring more um, new perspectives on IR theory. Uh, and so this, this um, what, what could you say, interaction between uh, the disciplines um, is very, has been very fruitful over the last um, years, a decade or so, um, and there hasn't been a book that explicitly took this as a, a subject. So we felt that there was a niche here that could be filled and could be of use both to scholars in the field as well as new students coming to the field. So that's really the, the rationale and background for why we wanted to do this book. And uh, of course, we hope that it's going to be useful and of interest to um, scholars and students alike out there. Um, it has uh, chapters on realism, on liberal institutionalism, rational choice institutionalism, social, sociological institutionalism, constructivism, practice theories, critical security studies, feminist institutionalism, and complexity theory. So quite a, a, a broad set of theoretical perspectives on um, peacekeeping. Um, I won't say very much more. I think it would be much better to spend the time we have to have a discussion and to let uh, those that have written individual chapters present some of their work. Um, I would also like, uh, would be great, Mats uh, is one of our contributors and he has written an excellent concluding chapter drawing the long lines, uh, you know, being a, a scholar that has been in this field much longer than, uh, than us. It would be great if he could also share some of his thoughts um, as we move on uh, during this discussion. Finally, I would also like to say happy birthday, Mats. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, John, for presenting the volume. Uh, thank you very much, Mats, for presenting our event and our project. And I would also like to say happy birthday, Mats. <laughs> um, I know it's very strange to have all these events virtually, but this is the world we live in. Um, and I, of course, would like to thank everyone who has joined our seminar, our book launch, um, for tuning in to learn more about uh, UN peacekeeping and international relations theories. And I have a presentation which I hope will be more interesting than looking at my face. Here we go. So I'm sharing my screen now and you should be able to see my presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, my chapter uh, or rather our chapter co-authored with Professor Carla Monteleone from uh, the University of Palermo. And uh, it's the second chapter of our volume and it's devoted to liberal institutionalism. And I myself am a research associate uh, in the War Studies Department at King's College London. So uh, uh, in terms of uh, liberal institutionalism, the central concept for this international relations theory is that of an international institution. And when we think about international institutions, we very often think about formal international organizations. We think about the UN, the European Union, um, the World Bank, the World Health Organization. But in addition to formal international organizations, there are also informal international institutions, uh, specific sets of uh, 
uh, norms, rules, um, practices that shape international interactions. Um, and um, in United Nations peacekeeping, we do have a combination of formal and informal uh, aspects of peacekeeping as an institution. And in general, in our volume, we wanted to look at United Nations peacekeeping as an international institution, not only from the perspective of liberal institutionalism, but also from all the other international uh, relations perspectives. In terms of specifically liberal institutionalism, there are some core assumptions of this international relations theory. And many of those assumptions are shared with, for example, realism. Both realism and, international, and liberal institutionalism assume that states are self-interested actors. They want to advance their own interest, they want to maximize uh, their utility, um, and in that sense, they're rational players that seek gains. But at the same time, unlike realism, liberal institutionalism assumes that cooperation is possible and states can achieve more through cooperation than competition. So international relations are not a zero sum game. Uh, so as a country, my loss uh, is not my opponent's gain necessarily. Sometimes when we have international conflicts, when we have breakdowns of security, everybody loses. So it makes sense for states to cooperate to advance those collective outcomes. And international institutions like the UN are very helpful for promoting cooperation. And one more assumption of uh, liberal institutionalism is that domestic publics, domestic actors, ranging from NGOs to industry groups, can have inputs in uh, um, international negotiations by pressuring their governments to do something. And I'll quickly discuss how it applies to uh, United Nations peacekeeping. In general, one would assume that liberal institutionalism would be quite a dominant perspective on United Nations peacekeeping, because it's about cooperation, uh, it's about international organization, uh, like the UN, um, it's about uh, um, mutually beneficial outcomes. But we have found, when writing this chapter, that uh, those applications uh, were not as widespread as we would imagine. At the same time, uh, in comparative politics um, that looks at United Nations peacekeeping, there are some applications of this theory of some concepts from liberal institutionalism. For example, peacekeeping has been analyzed as a signal uh, that parties to the conflict can send to each other. So when parties to the conflict invite peacekeepers, it can send a signal to their opponents that they are committed to peace. They're committed to the implementation of a particular peace agreement and they're committed to the peace process. So in that sense, peacekeeping can be seen as a signal. It has also been analyzed um, as um, a way of international influence because when international actors such as the UN come in and try to mediate uh, a, a particular conflict, try to um, shape a specific peace process, uh, they need to have leverage over the parties to the conflict and they can offer incentives or they can place constraints on those parties to make sure there is no breakdown of the peace process. And finally, sometimes peacekeeping has been used as a bargaining chip in negotiations. Uh, for example, one of the rare vetoes on a peacekeeping resolution was when China decided to veto to the extension of the UN preventative deployment in Macedonia after Macedonia uh, decided to recognize Taiwan. So in that case, peacekeeping uh, was used in, in you know, international um, relations, international affairs as a bargaining chip. So these are the applications uh, that we don't look um, at very closely in our chapter because we think that uh, they do not speak to this idea of peacekeeping as an institution. But when we think about peacekeeping as an institution, uh, a very important area is uh, troop contributions. As you all probably know, uh, the UN doesn't have a standing army, so it relies on member states to provide uh, peacekeepers, uh, both military and police, for its operations. And it does offer reimbursements 
uh, to those countries for peacekeeping deployments. But very often those reimbursements uh, uh, do not cover the cost of deployment, um, especially uh, for those countries um, with very advanced militaries. So uh, countries have various uh, motivations for contributing troops to United Nations peacekeeping, uh, which can be both material and uh, um, normative. It can be about commitment to peace, it can be about prestige. But specifically, um, liberal institutionalists would look at peacekeeping as a public good. And the public good is something from which all countries in the world benefit. And if we think, if we hope that United Nations peacekeeping is effective um, in uh, maintaining international peace and security, then we would expect all countries to try to uh, contribute to this public good. But at the same time, public goods suffer from specific problems, such as free riding. And uh, there is some interesting research that looks at the number of countries that contribute to peacekeeping, to a peacekeeping operation, um, and the shortfall uh, in their personnel contributions. Because many um, peacekeeping missions uh, do not have enough uh, peacekeepers. So the Security Council would authorize a certain size of a peacekeeping mission, uh, but sometimes the Secretariat wouldn't be able to find enough contributors. And it happens when there are many contributors to a peacekeeping mission. Another perspective on troop contributions would look at externalities. And uh, this perspective would essentially think of peacekeeping not as a public good, but as a, but, but as a club good. So um, certain countries benefit from peacekeeping uh, more than other countries. Because, for example, small island states might be completely unaffected by a conflict in uh, South Sudan, but the neighborhood, uh, the countries in the region, uh, would be deeply affected. They would experience refugee flows, uh, they would experience uh, uh, conflict spillover. And for that reason, they might be more motivated to contribute to peacekeeping, to promote uh, primarily their own security. And during the Cold War, it was considered um, um, inappropriate for great powers and neighboring countries to contribute peacekeeping troops. But this has changed, and now many neighbors participate very actively uh, through peacekeeping contributions in promoting regional security. So this is one of the perspectives where liberal institutionalism has been applied quite widely. One more aspect of peacekeeping decision-making uh, would look at the effect of domestic publics. And you might have heard this phrase called the CNN effect, which presupposes that media drives peacekeeping decision-making. And when people see terrible suffering, uh, when people see famine, when people see um, civilian victims on the screens, they start pressuring their government to do something about a conflict. And sometimes this pressure uh, can of course be productive, but it can also be counterproductive. Uh, when there are no conditions for a peacekeeping deployment, when a country is not really committed uh, to a particular peace process or conflict, um, then it can lead to uh, difficult situations. And the mission in Somalia in the 1990s is usually uh, held up as an example of uh, US intervention under the pressure from the media, from the public, uh, but it lacked staying power and the conditions were not right for a peacekeeping mission. And of course, it's linked to this idea of popular mobilization that civil society can mobilize uh, to try and pressure their governments into a peacekeeping deployment. And here, a more recent example is the mission in Darfur, where in the US there was a very unique domestic coalition that tried to pressure the US to intervene. And the coalition included uh, both uh, um, Christians and African Americans, because of course the conflict is in Africa and it was perceived that, that the Christians were being targeted. So that coalition essentially pressured the US into trying to deploy a UN mission. Uh, of course, the US itself didn't participate, but it played a significant role uh, in um, essentially persuading China uh, to put pressure on uh, Sudan government to allow the transition from an African Union to a United Nations peacekeeping mission. But at the same time, the effectiveness of that mission is disputed because the government uh, 
uh, of Sudan wasn't uh, really willing to allow the mission to do what it was supposed to do. So those are some of the ways in which uh, domestic inputs into foreign policy, into international negotiations can shape peacekeeping. Of course, the most natural uh, sphere um, of application of liberal institutionalism would be United Nations Security Council decision making, uh, UN Security Council negotiations. Because this is an arena for member states bargaining where they try to realize cooperative outcomes and it's uh, shaped by formal rules such as veto and informal rules as well. And in terms of veto, uh, the five permanent members of uh, the UN Security Council can block any resolution, including any peacekeeping resolution. And normally for research purposes, um, liberal institutionalists would often look at um, the voting record of international organizations. Uh, in the EU, for example, it's quite useful. Uh, one can see uh, how countries uh, form coalitions uh, when they vote against proposals, when they support proposals. But in terms of United Nations Security Council decision making, uh, the number of vetoes does not necessarily represent the level of cooperation or discord in this institution. Um, as we can see on this graph, uh, the, number, uh, the numbers of uh, um, negative votes or vetoes um, are relatively low. And of course, now we're in a more um, uncharted territory. Now we have uh, less cooperative council. We can see that uh, for the last five years, uh, the number of vetoes has increased. Um, while in the 90s, it was you know, from one to three vetoes per year, so it was quite cooperative. But still, when we think about uh, six, seven vetoes, um, and we think about the number of resolutions that uh, the Council passes every year, which can be 60 or 70, we can see that uh, um, a veto is quite an extreme event. And for this reason, we need to look for other tools for studying United Nations Security Council decision making. Uh, because very often peacekeeping resolutions are passed by consensus, even when um, member states would explain their vote, vote and they would say, well, we actually don't agree with this peacekeeping resolution, but hey, we're going to go along with it. And for this reason, uh, my co-author and I have um, looked at a particular informal practice. And this is a practice of sponsoring peacekeeping resolutions. So every resolution in the Security Council has to be moved by a particular member state or a coalition of member states. And we have noticed a very interesting pattern uh, in terms of change in this informal decision-making practices. For example, in the early uh, 2010s, there was a coalition that would normally propose or sponsor peacekeeping resolutions. And that coalition would be centered on the three Western permanent members, the US, the UK, and France, but would also very often include other transatlantic partners or would include African members. If we look, for example, at the resolution on the mission in Liberia that was passed in 2013, it was sponsored by the US, the UK, France, uh, Morocco, Togo, and Rwanda. And the resolution on the peacekeeping mission in Mali, which was actually the decision to deploy the mission in Mali. Um, besides uh, the US, the UK, France, um, we also had Luxembourg and Australia that were the co-sponsors of the resolution. And we also had the three African countries, um, Morocco, uh, Rwanda and Togo. So we can see that the sponsorship of peacekeeping resolutions was a, a collective endeavor, a collective practice, which has really changed. And in the recent years, we can see that many resolutions on peacekeeping are proposed by only one member. And usually it's a permanent member. And this practice is called pen holdership. So every permanent member would hold the pen on a particular conflict and would draft resolutions uh, on that um, country. And this practice is less cooperative and probably there are less inputs by other council members uh, into peacekeeping resolutions drafting process. 
Um, and here we can see, for example, how the three permanent uh, Western members uh, divided their responsibilities for different conflicts uh, that uh, the Council is addressing. Um, and essentially, we argue that um, it's important to look both at formal practices uh, and informal practices, informal rules, norms, informal institutions that shape um, peacekeeping decision making. And now we're going to move on to another chapter, which also looks at an aspect of peacekeeping as an institution, but looks more at the United Nations peacekeeping bureaucracy. So I'm going to give the floor to Sarah. Okay, hi everyone. I am just pulling up my slides. Bear with me one moment. Okay, um, so first of all, I can't say anything before I wish Mats a very happy birthday. Um, I think we're fully embarrassing you now, but luckily you've got your camera and your, and your sound off. So um, anyway, I hope it's a wonderful day and we are very grateful that you're taking some time on your birthday to chair this session. I'd also like to just say a quick thanks to John and Xenia who um, were fantastic editors for this volume um, all the way back from that workshop um, in Cardiff many years ago to um, having an actual copy of a book in our hands, which is great. Um, so my chapter looks at sociological institutionalism and UN peacekeeping, and this is a slightly different take than a lot of the scholarship on peacekeeping because it looks internally um, at the UN as an organization. Um, so I'll start by just saying a little bit more about what sociological institutionalism as a theory is. Uh, it draws heavily on sociology and on organization studies. Um, and its starting premise is that uh, the institutional environment, that is socially constructed institutional structures, rules, norms, uh, symbols, and images, um, have a very powerful influence on observed political outcomes. Specifically, it argues that the institutional environment does two things. The first is that it socializes political actors into particular roles, and so it constitutes them. Um, and the second is that it causes them to internalize uh, the norms associated with those roles. And so it influences their self-perceptions and their behavior. And this in turn reinforces the norms and rules of the environment. So we're in a sort of cyclical pattern. So put slightly differently, actors and institutions are mutually constituted and mutually constituting. Um, and institutions determine what is kind of possible and conceivable and meaningful in social life. Um, so the institutional environment doesn't just produce identities and self-images for actors, but it also delineates which actions are legitimate and it provides what sociological institutionalists call scripts and templates that enable them to respond to events and take action. Um, within organizations specifically, this behavior has been depicted as action that's taken according to a logic of appropriateness as opposed to a logic of expected consequences. That's a dichotomy many of you will have heard of. Um, efficiency is only one of many considerations when organization staff adopt policies and respond to events. Uh, and social legitimacy, so that alignment I was describing with organizational identities and norms and values, um, is often at least as, if not more, important. Uh, now, many have pointed out that this can, of course, lead to irrational or inefficient or even self-defeating policy choices in organizations, what some people call organizational dysfunction. Um, however, I think it's important to realize that a logic of appropriateness doesn't imply that actors aren't goal-oriented or that they behave irrationally. Um, according to sociological institutionalism, rationality is socially constructed, and so it's contingent on the organization environment. So rationality isn't just about utility maximization, but it's about defining goals and measuring success in ways that are valued within the organizational environment. Uh, scholars have described this kind of rationality as imperfect or bounded or garbage can rationality. Um, but basically the idea is that the logic of expected consequences is embedded in a larger logic of appropriateness and sort of norm guided behavior. Um, and so because of this, sociological institutionalism provides a really useful frame for understanding what appears to be contradictory and inefficient behavior in organizations, um, where alignment with norms and more utilitarian objectives of efficiency or outputs clash, uh, 
organization staff are often going to look for and adopt kind of contradictory policies. They're going to say one thing and do another in order to remain compliant with the expectations of the organizational environment. Uh, Bronson has famously called this organizational hypocrisy, uh, and he helpfully points out that the demands of institutional norms and the demands for efficiency and effectiveness in organizations are both sources of legitimacy um, in the organization. Before I apply all of this to peacekeeping, I just want to say a few words about organizational change, because I think it's really important when we're thinking theoretically about peacekeeping to consider um, how it evolves over time. So according to sociological institutionalism, organizations will adopt a new practice because it enhances social legitimacy in that context, not because or not only because it augments their efficiency. So change can increase efficiency, but only if that is something that is valued within that organization's institutional environment, um, and also if it doesn't contradict other valued norms and standards. So in this way, organizational culture, you know, frames, norms, and values, those, those set the scope for organizational learning and change. Um, and according to uh, Benner and his colleagues, this means that organizational learning will usually take the form of a sort of competitive process of internal negotiation and bargaining, where different actors within an organization are trying to make convincing claims about how their proposed change is the most closely aligned with the existing norms and rules of the organization. And it also implies that any change that seeks to actually shift or eliminate or add new norms and rules are extremely contested and usually very, very slow to be accepted, if at all, because they challenge that sort of fundamental self-image of organization staff. And when you see the slow pace of reform in most organizations, including the UN, this seems to be borne out by reality. I mean, every few years, there's another attempt to reform peacekeeping or the UN, um, and these things don't tend to, to make huge, huge differences. Um, so now a little bit about peacekeeping and sociological institutionalism. So this theory has really only been applied sporadically um, to UN peacekeeping. And this is part of what I sort of think of as a kind of two-way intellectual neglect. Um, sociological institutionalists tend not to include international organizations like the UN into their empirical studies. And studies of peacekeeping tend to study peacekeeping as a policy, not as an institution. Um, and so they neglect the organizational side of things. You know, in other words, we look at actors, we look at decision-making procedures, effectiveness, impact, outcomes, all that kind of stuff. But we tend to treat the institutional environment as kind of epiphenomenal. There are some ex ex exceptions to this, um, where scholars have kind of turned the lens inward uh, to identify and understand the institutional characteristics that give rise to behavior, contradictory behavior, inefficiency, failures, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, there's a few, few names on the board that most of you are probably familiar with, Barnett and Finnamore. Lipson has worked on this banner I already mentioned. Um, Lise Howard and Severino Tassel in my own recent work has been sort of in this direction. Um, but I would say that most of this work remains sort of disparate from one another, um, and it doesn't really form a cohesive body of scholarship on peacekeeping and sociological institutionalism. And so it's remained a kind of secondary theory and approaches to studying peacekeeping, which of course I think we should all change. Um, so to do that, um, I'm gonna just focus on one sort of single case study um, of how this can be applied to usefully to peacekeeping. Um, and specifically, I'm gonna look at um, the question of local ownership in UN peacekeeping. Um, and this is based on several years of research I've done on this topic and a lot of interviews with, um, with UN staff, as well as actually my own experience working for the UN previously. This is the kind of stuff we used to, <laughs> we used to think about. Um, so most of you will have heard of local ownership and, and know that the UN has persistently emphasized local ownership sort of over the past 20 years or so. It's become ubiquitous in, in UN discourse about peacekeeping. And it is now actually included as a kind of key principle of peacekeeping on, on the peacekeeping website, um, along with the sort of long-standing troika of consent, impartiality, and the non-use of force. Um, and in fact, there are a number of documents, including Security Council documents, that call local ownership a moral imperative. So why all this enthusiasm for local ownership? Well, local ownership is valued in peacekeeping because UN staff consider peacekeeping processes that are locally owned to be more legitimate. Why? Um, peacekeeping as, a, as an activity it necessitates deep, deep intrusion into lots of different local and national processes in host countries. And those are processes that are not normally open to external interference. Um, 
but in order to bring about sort of meaningful con conflict transformation, you have to intrude quite deeply. Now that intrusion, however, contravenes very highly valued norms relating to self-determination, uh, non-imposition, and uh, non-interference within the UN. These are principles that are enshrined in the organization's founding charter. So staff are put in this position where they sort of have to violate their stated principles in order to achieve their stated goals. Um, and this kind of directly goes against the self-image that UN peacekeeping staff have of themselves as kind of standard bearers um, for the principles of appropriate and legitimate behavior in the international system. Um, so as a result, peacekeeping staff seek out policies and approaches to peacekeeping that enable them to remain aligned with the principles and norms of the organizational environment, even if those policies and approaches are inefficient or unlikely to lead to success. And local ownership is one of those. It's perceived to lessen intrusion and to ensure that actions aren't imposed, but instead they're jointly agreed upon. And this makes them more appropriate within the institutional bounds of the UN. And I'll just read you one quote from an interview uh, to illustrate this. Um, There's a deep-seated political bias in the UN that the UN stands for self-determination rather than externally imposed neo-imperial forms of governance. Local ownership fits that view nicely. This is an important part of the UN's self-perception. So in this quote, you can see this person is thinking about how this helps UN staff perceive themselves. It's not so much about whether it's efficient or whether it's going to make peacekeeping more successful. Um, and more broadly, it enables staff to kind of reconcile these contradictions between their operational obligations and the institu institutional norms and values um, that, that exist within the UN. And it sort of allows them to be true to their organizational identities. And importantly, as I just said, this is the case even if local ownership is actually inefficient in a particular context or it weakens the chances of success or slows the delivery of outputs. Uh, and interestingly, in my interviews with UN staff, that's pretty much exactly what everybody said. They, basically, everybody said local ownership is inefficient. It delays, it prevents, um, it prevents us from being efficient. Um, because the UN has to share responsibility for decision making uh, and implementation with actors who might have weak capacities or illiberal or authoritarian objectives. Um, so I'll just read you a couple more quotes to, to show how this, how, how this came through. Um, one UN official stated that involving local actors slowed everything down to no end. Another noted that local, local actors don't have the capacity or neutrality for implementation. Um, another one said that local ownership resulted in delaying and complicating the achievement of our objectives. And another one said, well, you know, we have ownership in mind, but we just do things for them sometimes because there's a pressure to deliver. Um, yet these exact same staff, this, the ones who express these concerns about local ownership and whether it's an efficient policy, also maintain wholeheartedly that it was the right thing to do. And, and indeed, not only that it was the right thing to do sometimes, but that it should always guide peacekeeping activities. Um, you know, it's, as I said before, it's become a key principle of peacekeeping and as a principle, it can't be appropriate only sometimes and in some places, it has to always be appropriate and everywhere be appropriate. However, and I think this is really critical, um, as I mentioned before, peacekeeping staff aren't only motivated by kind of compliance with norms, they are also motivated by these sort of more utilitarian considerations of output and results. Um, because those are also social goods that are valued within the institutional environment of the UN. Um, so rational behavior in the UN means both trying to comply with those institutional norms and realize goals and outputs. Um, and local ownership therefore becomes very problematic because it's largely considered to be hugely inefficient um, and to imperil the delivery of stated objectives. Um, so as a result, I think what we see is that local ownership has become primarily a discursive tool for UN staff. It's something that allows them to portray their actions as locally owned, even if in practice they're not. So you hear a lot being said about local ownership and involvement and inclusion and these kinds of things. Um, but my research has, has shown that local ownership is very rarely actually implemented or only partly implemented. Um, and, you know, the UN has, has actually done very little to sort of coherently define what local ownership is sort of issue concrete guidelines about how to do it in practice or to monitor whether local actors actually feel any sense of ownership. Um, and instead, I think local ownership be, remains this kind of discursive tool, as I mentioned, it's one of these scripts and templates I described before that enables UN staff to legitimize their behavior and to convince themselves and others that they are actually behaving appropriately 
within the bounds of the UN's organizational culture. Um, this invocation of local ownership without any heed to operational performance constitutes a form of what some scholars call decoupling. So there are practices that are not helpful from an efficiency point of view, but they're maintained because of their symbolic function. They're decoupled from the actual behavior. So in other words, staff use kind of talk about local ownership to reconcile these conflicting institutional imperatives, uh, and, but with the result that they end up saying one thing and doing another. So just to wrap up quickly, um, I think local ownership illustrates nicely how peacekeeping staff are socialized by their environment, their organizational environment, to view certain policy choices as acceptable, appropriate, and necessary because they align with the organizational uh, principles and values of the UN. Um, and I think it also shows how UN staff use templates and frames to explain and demonstrate how their behavior, even contradictory behavior, actually aligns with that institutional identity. Um, and I'll, I'll end there just to say, to sort of end with a plea, I suppose, um, to give sociological institutionalism more room in our understanding of UN peacekeeping, because I think it's really important to understand the UN as an organization in order to fully understand what it does and its activities. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I think it's uh, it's back to me. Um, first of all, thank you very much for those very um, substantive. Hang on a second. I'll be with you. There we are. Um, thank you very much for those very substantive um, contributions. And also, uh, thank you, of course, for remembering my birthday. I am much appreciated and thoroughly embarrassed. But thank you nonetheless. Uh, John mentioned um, that I had contributed to this book and that I might say a few words um, about not so much my contribution, but what I think about the book as a contribution to the study of, of peacekeeping and to international relations theory. And I might just say a few words um, a way of introduction to the actual discussion. In the meantime, if you have questions, which I'm sure you will have, just enter them in the chat box and I'll try to, um, and I'll try to keep track. Uh, just a couple of couple of points that struck me. Um, <clears throat> and the, the first thing, uh, and this is what makes the study of peacekeeping so interesting, is that if we accept that a broad definition of peacekeeping or peace operations as third party intervention aimed at mitigating, containing, contributing to the resolution of conflict in the international system, if we accept that uh, as a broad definition, then the institution of peacekeeping and peacekeeping as a set of activities, uh, by its very nature, raises a whole set of issues uh, that touch directly upon what is the, the meat, if you like, of international relations, conflict and cooperation, sovereignty and intervention, norms and norm diffusion, the use and utility of military force, the changing character of armed conflict, all these issues that are central to the study of international relations and international politics are, are, are automatically there if you engage with the study of peacekeeping. And on the last point that Sarah made, which I think is a very important one about organizations, I mean, it reminds me of the preface that Ines Claude, the great scholar of international organization, wrote to his, I think, fourth edition of his book, on organizations uh, where he said that to study international organizations intelligently is to study international politics. And I think that in itself is something well worth uh, remembering. And just to illustrate this, I mean, when peacekeeping started out in the early 1950s, it was in itself an adaptation of the organization to the particular circumstances of the Cold War. With the end of the Cold War and the shift in normative boundaries, the character of peacekeeping itself changes. Uh, so I think that's an important connection between um, peacekeeping and the study of international relations. It's not just that it's a sort of narrow field in which we can toil and get an interest, um, but I think it raises these issues almost automatically when we look at them. So that's the first general point I wanted to make. Uh, 
then I wanted to, to just say a couple of words about the, the themes covered in the book. And they are excellent chapters. And what they all do, of course, is to help cast some light on the way in which the scale and the scope and the focus of, of UN peace operations have, has evolved over time. And that is clearly undeniable. The vast majority of, of peacekeeping operations at present, and indeed since the early 1990s, are, are focused on intrastate conflict. And indeed, many large operations are deployed in the context of an ongoing war. And the range of tasks undertaken by peacekeeper, of course, is much greater than it used to be in the classical era. And I think many of the chapters, take for example the chapter on complexity theory by Charles Hunt, throws some very, very interesting light uh, on how to understand um, the sheer complexity of these operations and also analyze um, uh, their workings. Yet at the same time, and something I wanted to focus and emphasize in my sort of concluding remarks to the book, um, while we rightly focus attention on the element of change over time, I think it's very important always to be mindful of the elements of, of continuity as well as discontinuity in the, in the study of peacekeeping and also in the utility of theoretical um, uh, frameworks for analyzing it. And, and what do I mean by that? Let, let me just single out uh, uh, four elements of, of, of continuity and, and that run alongside um, the changes uh, since the early 90s. The first is that this is a book about United Nations peace operations. And of course, the defining characteristics of the UN as an organization specifically its intergovernmental character, uh, its deeply political nature, and its fragmented, uh, functionally fragmented character, those, those features remain fundamentally unchanged. And given the UN's central role in authorizing and in mounting and sustaining operation, that matters greatly. And I think, uh, therefore, Sarah's contribution, uh, on sociological uh, institutionalism is, is very, very apposite and very important and very interesting. We need to look at the organization itself in a way that we often do not. I think I, I make the point um, that certainly uh, normally com commentary on the UN tends to slip into the UN did this or the UN failed to do that. Um, and when you slip into that kind of language, the actual workings of it as an organization, um, the fact that it is a membership organization shaped in a sociological sense, sketched by, by Sarah just now, is often lost. And I think it's important to, to recognize that. And uh, this, for the study of peacekeeping, it's absolutely vital. If we try to understand the attitude, for example, of true contributing countries um, to, to the fundamentals of peacekeeping, if we try to understand how the Secretariat behaves in certain circumstances, a focus on that is vital. But here, I think there is an element of, of, of continuity as well as discontinuity. The second element, I think, of continuity, which is interesting um, and, and, and has been much debated, of course, revolves around the question of the fundamental roles and functions of UN peacekeeping, particularly its defining characteristics uh, as being that of consent of the parties, the impartiality as the determinant of operational activity, and minimum use of force except in self-defense. Now, again, undeniably the case, and, and Jon Kalser has written about this extremely well elsewhere, undeniably the case that consent has frequently proved uh, partial and incomplete in many contemporary mission settings. Uh, and indeed that the UN has been applying force in a much more robust manner. But even so, member states, including the Security Council, uh, for a mixture of, I think, principled and pragmatic reasons, have been reluctant to reject the, what we might call the essential character of peacekeeping as a third party activity that relies on a measure of consent, impartiality, and a minimum use of force. So the whole discussion about the use of force, to some extent, revolves around this. And you can see how this ties into issues such as, as the question of protection of civilian, of course, which has become a very major and important mandate uh, for UN operation. Uh, and this brings me to the sort of third, if you like, 
element of continuity ties into that, that although we tend to speak of, uh, and the textbooks will tell you about traditional or classical or first generation peacekeeping, I think the, the whole history of peacekeeping, right back to its inception in the 1950s or even late 40s, uh, is richer and more varied than is often recognized. There is a very important disjunction with the end of the Cold War, no doubt about that, but many operations during the Cold War, particularly the Congo operation from 60 to 64, and also interestingly operations in, in, in Lebanon and Cyprus, uh, raised many of the issues and challenges faced by the inherent difficulties of inserting and operating any kind of outside civilian and military force in a third party capacity in the midst of an ongoing war. And I think uh, it is very useful to bear that original experience in mind. Uh, Jon Karlsruhe joins us from, from Oslo, and we have spoken about this. His institution, the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs, has a very long and distinguished history of studying peacekeeping. And after the Congo operation in the 1960s, they published a book which you'll find in the... Um, in the library, hopefully still, called the Oslo Papers. And the Oslo Papers is a compilation of reflections, really, on the challenges the UN faced in the Congo. And I, I looked at it uh, early on when I started writing about peacekeeping, and I found an extraordinary useful source, uh, both for reflection and insight into peacekeeping, drawing from that particular experience. Um, and again, this is not to say that there haven't been very, very important changes, but I think um, we need to be mindful of the element of continuity there as well. And the final sort of source of, I think, I suppose, continuity, I think, is in the nature of and the continuities in the international political system itself and the sources of state conduct, specifically uh, considerations of interest, power and prestige continue to matter greatly to states, whatever we think about that as principal drivers of it. And I think as, as, as is, is made clear in the chapter on realism in the book, um, UN peacekeeping simply can't be divorced from an appreciation of the continuing importance of power politics uh, in international affairs. The final point I simply want to make, uh, really concerns the sort of value of this particular book and the value of, of, of theorizing. Um, I think what these different chapters do very, very well uh, is to, to bring new perspectives uh, and to analyze, just as Sarah did, uh, dimensions which have been much neglected in the past, uh, the nature of the organization, um, the, the way the Secretariat works, to take that particular example, and, and by doing so, opening new avenues for future research. Uh, and I think there are many, many areas which have been neglected. There's a very interesting chapter on gendered power relations within institutions, um, which is well worth reading and thinking much more seriously about. But what I think all these chapters also do, uh, and I feel that quite strongly, is that they do bring out, I think, that, that theorizing itself is necessarily an iterative process and that the value of these different theoretical lenses, which is what the editors describe these as being, rather than separate and self-contained paradigms, if you like, their value um, are tested or must be tested and refined in light of, of rigorous empirical investigation of actual operations, whether contemporary or historical. Um, if you don't have that sort of element, that iterative process, of course, there is always a danger that theories can become um, isolated or self-referential even, or even worse than that. And here I think we are fortunate in looking forward in that there is much increased availability, and I've spoken to Ksenia about this, and she has taken advantage of this, that is a greater availability of what we might call sort of new primary sources, um, uh, either done through rigorous fieldwork and interviews, but also things that have been released, particularly from the operations in the 1990s, uh, unsurprisingly, the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Uh, and I think that material is enormously interesting as a sort of as a resource um, with which many of these theoretical lenses can, can begin to uh, can engage. Um, 
And I think the fact that we now have this kind of material to a greater degree that, that scholars and practitioners are willing to speak more openly about it um, ensures to my mind that this will continue to be a very fertile field of research, both for theorists and an area for practitioners as well. So those are the kinds of initial uh, comments I wanted to make, but I want to open up for, um, for questions and I will do that uh, straight away. I hope that uh, Aisha will tell me if everything is, is working or not working, perhaps you should tell me according to plan. But let me see uh, if I can turn to Anna, Anna Maria. Can you hear me, Anna? Let, I can't hear Anna at the moment, but let me just try to stick properly to my list. Kieran, Kieran Connolly, do you want to ask your question? Uh, unmuting your microphone. Kieran Connolly. What I can do, uh, if the fellow panelists, you can all nod if you can still hear me. Can you nod me? Okay, then I'll, ask the, I'll address the question to you. Uh, and Kieran asks whether uh, my question is in peacekeeping, which there are short of participants. Do you, the panel, think it is a shape for private military contractors to pick up the slack? So the role of private actors to fill the gap where the UN isn't able to, to generate enough troops for a mission. I don't know who wants to start. Uh... Okay, I can start. Um, since this is a question about uh, troop contributions and I have addressed it as part of my presentation. Um, of course, it's a very big debate and we know that um, the UN uh, doesn't rely as much on private military contractors as uh, some national militaries. Uh, that participate in stabilization operations. We do know that uh, uh, the extent to which those companies were used in uh, Iraq, for example, and to some extent Afghanistan, is very different from, from UN peacekeeping. And of course, with UN peacekeeping, uh, there are certain constraints, and uh, those constraints are also financial, uh, because um, uh, the troop contributions by member states uh, are often much cheaper for the UN than hiring a private military company. And there are also questions of accountability, since we know that some private military companies uh, um, haven't behaved professionally in some of the conflicts uh, where they were deployed. So for, for the UN, it's a huge uh, reputational risk. And also, in terms of the legitimacy of UN peacekeeping as a practice, as an institution, it does rely on this multinational uh, character of its forces uh, in order to be more acceptable to all parties to the conflict. And, uh, you know, contributors come from Latin America, from Asia, from all over the place. While private military companies are usually based in a specific number of Western countries. So I think there are many risks and constraints for the UN. And I do not think that we are going to see an increase in the use of private military companies in peacekeeping. But I mean, of course, those companies are present and private contractors are present in peacekeeping for various issues, logistics, transportation, but in terms of like frontline fighting uh, combat roles, um, I think there are some risks and constraints. I might just add to what Ksenia has said. Um, thinking about it, of course, from a sort of organizational perspective, um, there's a very strong kind of anti-mercenary norm within the UN. I think there's even a working group on the use of mercenaries, and essentially its job is to be critical of the practice. Uh, and I, I think n the non-use of, of kind of private military companies fits with um, the stated principles of the organization, that it is intergovernmental, that we are um, behaving in out of a sort of sense of, of doing good, not out of a sense of earning profit, which is what private companies are, of course, doing. Um, and then, of course, all the additional um, uh, points that Ksenia has already made about, you know, uh, 
um, finances and accountability and so on. Um, but what's interesting here is that there are many instances in which one could argue that using a private military company would be more efficient. You go in, you get something done and you go out. Um, and so there is a bit of a tension there because you know, efficiency is also something that the UN is um, both aiming for and under pressure to, to, to realize. Um, so I think exactly we'll, there will be a sort of balance reached where the private contractors are used for things like site security and logistics, um, but not necessarily for actual frontline combat. That's too high profile. It's too sort of too much part of the, the vis visible identity of the UN as a, as a peacekeeping actor. Thank you very much. I've now been instructed that I have to read out the question, so I apologize for that. Um, let me do the next question. There, there was, that was the sort of, we talked about the interaction of IR theory and peacekeeping, but there was also a question of what unique features of, if any, of peacekeeping might serve as a lens to also illuminate IR theory. Um, I, 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 I will just invite my panelists to answer that, but I simply wanted to, I sort of, I think I hinted at it when I made a reference to the chapter on, uh, on, on, uh, on realism. I mean, it is quite clear that um, peacekeeping um, and the practice of peacekeeping, we look at individual operations in details and how member, sh member states behave in terms of providing troops or their response to the rules and regulation governing, uh, very much have their own uh, interests in mind as, as well as some higher calling about the way to prove. So I think in that sense, it does confirm important elements of, 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 of realist uh, thinking and behavior, but it doesn't exclude necessarily um, uh, other insight that it brings to there. And I sort of suggested that, um, you know, methodological uh, pluralism is, is very useful in, in, in pointing to various aspects of, of, of peacekeeping, but who wants to, on my panel, wants to come in there? Jon, did you have a... Or, or, I could start, um, perhaps, but um, yeah, in my own work, I've, I've been trying to look at how um, informal alliances of actors within and outside of the UN have uh, advanced change um, in what I call linked ecologies. And definitely, I, 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 when I did that work, you know, I, I thought of it as, uh, as much as contributing to IR theory as to contributing to the peacekeeping literature, hopefully, at least. That was uh, my ambition. And, my interests, so. Okay, um, if, if I may go next. Um, um, I think it's a very important question because we have indeed looked at how IR theory helps us understand peacekeeping. But in terms of uh, peacekeeping and its unique features for studying IR theory, for me, one of the most interesting aspects is this combination of unilateral policies and the multilateral character of peacekeeping. Um, and this goes back to the fundamental question of IR to me, which is power and how different actors project power and try to use it uh, uh, for their own gain or for collective uh, gain. And in peacekeeping, we do really see that. We know that um, you know, big powers on the Security Council, they try to um, authorized peacekeeping resolutions. They try to keep control of the decision-making process very often in countries where they have national interests, very often in their former colonies. We see that with France and some African conflicts um, where peacekeeping missions co-deploy with French unilateral military operations. And there we have interesting dynamics. So I think this tension between you know, acting alone and acting collectively uh, is very present in peacekeeping. And I think it's one of those big questions for IR theory as well. Uh, I'll just add something very brief um, related to what Ksenia has just said. I think uh, for me, what's fascinating about peacekeeping is the sort of confluence of um, state actors and organizational actors. Um, and interestingly, because the organizations are, again, made up of states, and yet we tend to think of them as in tension with one another. And so I, it's a sort of very messy, circular situation, uh, but I, can't, I can think of very few other phenomena in the study of international relations and politics where you have that. And so I think there's a lot to learn for IR theory more broadly from peacekeeping in that regard. 
Thank you very much. Um, we have a question from now from Ana Maria Albulescu. Um, as your chapter focuses on analyzing domestic preferences for UN peacekeeping by looking at the role of states as part of UN Security Council negotiations, do you see any additional role for the international civil service as well as individuals in shaping UN member states' policies on peacekeeping related decisions? Mm -hmm. um, yes, thank you, uh, Anna Maria, for this question. Uh, it's a very important question. And I think it has two parts. One looks at the role of individuals and one looks at the role of civil service, which I presume is the UN Secretariat. And in terms of the role of individuals, uh, the chapter on practice theory does address the question of individual influence and individual social capital and how uh, UN officials and Security Council ambassadors can draw on those resources to advance their own vision of peacekeeping. So yes, individuals do play a role, um, and I think particularly practice theory is a useful lens. And uh, John's own work uh, in terms of linked ecologies also looked at alliances between very often individual actors, uh, like, um, for example, civilian heads of peacekeeping missions, uh, special representatives of the Secretary General, uh, force commanders, um, individuals in important roles who can shape peacekeeping. And in terms of the role of the UN Secretariat, uh, not as much as an implementer of peacekeeping mandates, which is what Sarah has talked about, but more about as a stakeholder in the decision-making process. Um, I think the Secretariat has influence, but it's very often limited because the Security Council doesn't have to take uh, secretariat's advice into consideration. And actually I uh, and my co-author have um, uh, an article coming out in Global Governance in spring which, which, which compares uh, secretariat reports on peacekeeping that recommend peacekeeping options, that recommend peacekeeping mandates with the actual resolutions. And we can see that the secretariat advice does shape peacekeeping decision making, but very often the Security Council can ignore it. We know, for example, that uh, the mission in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, in the early zeros was given a much more forceful protection of civilians mandate. And the Secretariat was completely opposed. In its uh, 2000, 2002 report, the Secretariat said the mission doesn't have the capacity to protect civilians. And Security Council nevertheless went on to authorize um, quite a proactive uh, uh, protection mandate. So yes, individuals and uh, the Secretariat have a role to play, but it's often limited. I, I just want to, to, to echo what Xenia said about the importance of that question. I also think that um, one of the neglected areas, perhaps, of study of UN operations, the importance of, of the role played by, by individuals, particularly those that run the missions, um, and also, indeed, the, the Secretariat itself. I mean, there is a tendency, and one reason for this is that uh, when things, to put it very crudely, uh, when things go badly wrong and uh, in a mission, uh, and it has gone catastrophically wrong at times, there is a tendency perhaps not surprisingly, for member states to blame, to blame the, uh, the Secretariat for not being up to it. Uh, and likewise, if you turn to the Secretariat, they will say that uh, lack of political will, there is very little we can do. Now, there is a core of truth to that, of course, but it's not quite as simple as that. Uh, there is a complex interaction between these two UNs, if you like, and, and, and what is fascinating to study, and this is why I made reference to uh, the availability of new primary source material, is precisely how that relationship plays out in individual missions. I think if you look at some operations, I think um, it's difficult to explain the trajectory of that operation, whether it is successful or unsuccessful, without also an appreciation of the individual leaders that led that particular mission. Uh, and I think here again, the different perspectives in this book um, point to that and suggest that's an important thing. And of course, at the top of the pyramid, of course, within the Secretariat, the Secretary General himself has potentially a very important role. 
uh, to play. Uh, he is not just the chief administrative officer, but also has a political role. And again, that role has been used in different ways by different secretariats. There's been some very interesting reflections on, for example, Perez de Cuellar's role at that critical moment between 87 and, and, and 92, uh, when the UN was very successful in helping to unwind uh, various uh, long-running uh, Cold War conflicts. And I think it's been persuasively argued that wasn't simply a matter of, you know, the Cold War coming to an end, and of course they would agree. He also played a very important role in making sure um, that the UN was able to facilitate and support the interests of member states. So I think your question is a very pertinent one, and I think it opens up very interesting avenues for future research. I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just say very quickly, um, some more recent research that I'm working on with Xenia and a couple of other people, including at King's, um, in, in the field work that we've conducted, the role of individual um, heads of missions, so at the sec special representative of the Secretary General or SRSG, um, has quite an influence in shaping sort of events on the ground in, in terms of their own risk aversion, in terms of the um, relations they're able to build with, with national actors, the relations they have uh, with New York, um, and those can actually end up having some fairly concrete consequences for how um, a mission's position continues or doesn't continue in a particular country. Uh, so again, I would say it, it wasn't something we were actually even really investigating, but it kept coming up in one interview after another when someone would say, under this SRSG, this happened, but then it all changed when this person came along. So I think there's actually a lot more scope for looking at what are the qualities that, and characteristics of different heads of mission and how those influence what's happening on the ground. Thank you very much. I will. Um just echo that again. For some of you in the audience, I think, uh, took part in a, um, in a in a live sort of uh, Q&A we had with the head of the current mission in, uh, in South Sudan two days ago, SRSG, David Shearer. And it was very clear from that talk, just precisely what Sarah was saying now, that although he's very, very constrained by the mandate, by the resources and other things, it is also scope for him to interpret the situation the ground and take initiative where he sees fit and with the resources he's got and uh, let me read our next question uh, faraj asks um there have been many debates regarding the possibility of using pmcs in peacekeeping missions instead of deploying military personnel from member states what are your thoughts on that and do you think it will be an effective tool so the use of private military companies or private military actors in peacekeeping as an alternative. Who wants to have a first go? I'll, I'll just, I, I mean, I don't have that much more to add to what we said before when we had a, a somewhat similar question or a question on the same topic in yeah. any case. Um, I mean, again, I think, I guess I would, maybe pick on in a very academic way i'm going to pick on one of the words in the question which is whether this would be an effective tool it depends a little bit how you define effectiveness in peacekeeping whether it is simply a matter of going in and accomplishing some sort of combat mission then potentially yes you could argue that there is room for pmc's as an effective tool but i think in peacekeeping we need to think of effectiveness in very different ways um, it's not just about achieving a short-term objective and it's a much um, sort of more networked kind of effectiveness where there is a short-term objective but there's also keeping New York happy and there's also keeping national actors happy and there's keeping troop contributors happy and there's keeping the staff happy you know there's so many different layers to what constitutes a good tool and this is partly why I think it's very hard to be successful at peacekeeping um, but I think given that complexity um, using PMCs for for sort of frontline military instead of member states is probably not likely to happen because too many of those involved stakeholders would be unhappy about it. The, did, John, did you say want to say something? No, I. I was just trying to scroll through the the questions, okay. um, um, but uh, I mean um, we have already touched upon this. But uh, of course, uh, PMCs or, or private military company or contractors, uh, security companies play a role in peacekeeping missions already. Uh, and uh, some papers are looking into that. Um, 
but uh, and then try to contrast using this organized democracy um, um, concept, trying to contrast that to the, to the mission um, goal. Uh, but I've, it's like we have already touched upon. It's a it's a matter of also what kind of tasks these uh, actors are given in missions, and probably it's not in the foreseeable future possible to to kind of um, contemplate that um, these uh, PMCs will have. The, the frontline tasks. Um, not much to add, actually, uh, from my side. Yes, I, I just, I think that's that's essentially being covered. I mean, the obvious point being that you know PMCs come in many different shapes and sizes and guises. I think you can imagine private actors, and it has indeed been the case, providing you know fairly basic. Uh, but important uh, enabling support functions for a mission. Um, but that's very different from what John described as a frontline role. And I think there is also the, the, the fact, uh, many might think this is surprising still, that, that the UN just retains a greater degree of, of legitimacy in many of these settings by virtue of its universal character. It is true that the UN flag has become an object of, of targeting itself in a way it didn't used to be before, but there is still that sense in which, uh, and it's an advantage it holds even vis-a-vis -vis some regional organization that it does represent, as it were, the international community. And that does buy it some, um, some credibility and some legitimacy. Um, compared particularly perhaps to private actors where the suspicion of other motives will tend to come to the surface. Um, let me read the next question. I think this is for you, Ksenia, you might see it as well. It was said that a liberal institutionalism in simple terms is equivalent to cooperation and leads to gain and prosperity for the states who are involved in it. So in the case of UN peacekeeping, what would main permanent members of the UN gain from this peacemaking cooperation, their interest? What, why the main permanent members of the UN be engaged in peacekeeping? Yeah, this is, of course, a question that goes to the heart of uh, liberal institutionalism that looks at how states cooperate and why states cooperate. And I think every permanent member has uh, their specific interests involved. Uh, we see that China participates more and more in peacekeeping. Uh, China is a large financial co contributor now. Uh, it also contributes tro troops to peacekeeping missions, which is quite unique for the permanent member. Um, and uh, China especially focuses on, on Africa. And we know that in Africa, uh, China has uh, very important trade interests, very important economic interests. Uh, it also tries to project its uh, soft power in Africa. So it has a very specific uh, regional focus. So um, uh, by participating in peacekeeping missions, uh, uh, governments can build very important relations with host states and they can later on participate in economic reconstruction after the conflict. So often they want to gain foothold in specific countries to realize uh, their economic or security interests. And when we look, for example, at uh, the US, uh, for the US, it's also a question of credibility, since it often projects an image of the leader of the free world. Uh, it also has a special responsibility to maintain international peace and security. And in the case of France, for example, I've already, I've already discussed how in Francophone Africa, uh, the French mission in New York is very active in shaping peacekeeping. And I think another interesting trend in terms of permanent members uh, and peacekeeping is the new focus on counterterrorism. And I think John has written many excellent articles about uh, um, this new consensus among the permanent members in terms of using peacekeeping for stabilization and counterterrorism. Perhaps I should pick up there. Uh -huh. um, well, it is an interesting con kind of convergence. And uh, what we talked about earlier is perhaps would be a more blatant way of, of uh, using the UN for exactly the purposes uh, you want to, in a way, using in, in inserting PMCs into them. But a more kind of um, uh, a softer approach is, of course, to uh, to instruct the UN to work closely with uh, sub-regional organizations uh, to give them logistical support, uh, 
and other things um and uh, and thus dragging the UN a bit into the the areas of stabilization and counterterrorism um and this is what we see some other places in mali and elsewhere um of course very challenging uh, both for the people on the ground and, and uh, more in terms of doctrine in terms of um yeah legitimacy and so forth and for the the organization the larger part the large the, the other parts of the organization so the humanitarian uh, actors uh, under the un flag and so forth um but i mean i, I won't um, talk very long about that here you have, have to unmute Mats. so sorry uh forgot about that um just just want to add add one one point to this i i, I agree very much with what's been said um but, but i think we often speak in terms of there being a a tension or a direct conflict between principle on the one hand and interest on the other and of course that exists and in many cases that will be acute uh, but of course, very often, um, in terms of, of the UN intervention, uh, the most successful one, quote unquote, every, everything is relative, is where issues of principle and interest come together. And particularly when a major power or one power is prepared to take the lead in orchestrating an operation, partly for reasons of interest, uh, but also prin principle. So I mean, take East Timor, for example, where Australia decided to take the lead. Uh, Haiti in 1994, where the Americans took the lead. They were all powerful national interests at stake, as they perceived them, but also they served a, a wider purpose. So there doesn't necessarily have to be a conflict always between uh, the two. But, but nonetheless, uh, you're right, and I think the whole counterterrorism um, issue is a very interesting one the way it has crept into mandates in the way that the high level panel on peacekeeping operation from 2015 clearly thought would be a bad idea um but member states as far as i can tell some of them have said well it might be a bad idea but that's what you should be getting on with um let me take the next question um peacekeeping has become a tool to project power, it ties into this. And this can be seen in Security Council Re Resolution 1973, 2011 in Libya, and how China and Russia are vetoing Security Council Resolution to protect civilians in Syria. And you suggest that this has discredited UN peacekeeping missions. What do you think the UN can do to restore its international position? Okay. I, I was going to challenge bits of the question, but I let others do it as well, perhaps if they want to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an important question, but um, I don't think that this question is necessarily about peacekeeping. Because peacekeeping has, of course, evolved, and Mats has talked about the difficult question of consent, which can be you know, partial, it can be invited, it can be coerced. Uh, like in Darfur. But at the same time, a fundamental feature of peacekeeping is the consent of the host government. And obviously, Syria is not willing to consent to a peacekeeping operation. So this is really more a question about humanitarian, well, we don't call it humanitarian intervention anymore, we call it responsibility to protect. So this is a question about responsibility to protect, whether countries are willing to override the host government and deploy troops even when they're not invited and i think it's a different debate a very important debate but we haven't really looked at it in our edited volume because we wanted to focus more on peacekeeping any other comments any other comments from our panelists on on, on this as a perhaps peacekeeping as a tool to project power uh, I don't think, like you said, 1973 isn't really about peacekeeping operation, um, nor is there a peacekeeping mission in Syria. But I think the question of whether peacekeeping can be a tool to project power, maybe there are comments on that or questions related to that. Well, I would just, I would, my, my question would be for whom to project power. I mean, I always hesitate, so I have, perhaps unpopular views on how we should conceive of the UN, but I, 
I waver between viewing the member states as part of the UN and as com something completely separate from the UN. So when people talk about the Security Council, I'm sometimes tempted to consider it um, an external body to the Secretariat. I mean, in many ways it is. Um, so when, when I see a question like this, I'm thinking, well, who exactly here is projecting power? And it's this classic point that Mats made earlier about, you know, um, who should be discredited here if it's China and Russia who are who are vetoing, does that discredit the UN or does it discredit them as member states in the Security Council with the, the power of the veto? Uh, so I think there's a lot to untangle there um, that goes beyond peacekeeping itself that is more about um, power relations between, between um, big countries, between P5 members. Um, but I'm not sure whether, I think in the popular imagination, it discredits the UN potentially when there's the inability to reach a resolution on something. Um, but I, but I do actually think that might be one of the moments when we need to think of the Security Council as a, something separate from the UN, um, because the UN can only urge and encourage and lobby, um, but ultimately it doesn't get to, to sit in and vote in that in that Security Council chamber. Um, perhaps let me pick up there, um, because in a way, although I completely agree with Sarah, it also points to uh, what an uh, incredibly rich source of empirical material UN peacekeeping is um, with all its uh, like we already touched upon but with all its levels of units of analysis uh, from the Security Council uh, to the UN that itself is uh, you know many layered and has many different centers of agency between the, the, the General Assembly between the Secretariat the Security Council the field missions uh, and all the interactions between different levels and the UN itself and member states, uh, it's a fantastic source of study. So uh, I think um, I'll just jump into uh, to my kind of the final words and say, that's also why it's such a good uh, source uh, for, uh, for uh, international relations theory. It's, uh, you, can, you can study it from all kinds of angles with all kinds of theoretical um, instruments and methodological uh, approaches and so forth. So um, yeah. Um, very interesting material indeed. Great, uh, John, you started the, uh, the wrap, wrapping up, which is great. So why don't we move on to Xenia? Would you like to, to have a concluding uh, paragraph or sentence or words? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mats, for sharing. Uh, thank you, Sarah and John, for joining us uh, for this presentation and for the book project. It's very um, I'm very happy to see it out and I hope that everybody who attended would also be interested in reading it. Uh, it's available as an ebook as well as a printed book uh, and uh, you can read the introduction for free on ResearchGate uh, if you're interested in these issues. And I think the questions were excellent so I would like to thank everyone for those questions. They have touched upon many many important aspects ranging from power politics to the idea of secretariat's influence to the notion of the role of individuals in peacekeeping um, to private contractors, private actors uh, in uh, peacekeeping deployments. So very, very important questions. And as you can see, when we talk about peacekeeping, we do discuss so many issues, international corporations, uh, norms and their evolution. We discuss ethics, we discuss outcomes, we discuss the role of international bureaucracies, uh, the role of um, decision-making bodies. Uh, so yeah, I would like to echo John and just say that uh, UN peacekeeping is an amazing subject to study empirically, uh, theoretically, and for policy and practical reasons. Uh, Sarah, any concluding observations? Um, yeah, just very briefly um, to first uh, thank you and uh, Xenia and John all, all for, um, for bringing us here today and uh, to everybody else who has come and asked really excellent, rich questions. And just to sort of pick up on a thought that's been kicking around in my mind as I've listened and responded. Um, I mean, we've talked about different agents within the UN family, the structure of the organization, um, you know, the role of private actors, of individuals. Um, 
And it just makes me realize, again, it's not a, a new thought, but I think it's an important one to remember from time to time that what, what exactly peacekeeping is, uh, it is very blurred around the edges. Um, and, you know, once you start to think about it, it leads you on to so many other other topics and, and issues. And it's, um, it can be very hard to study in isolation because it is by definition a sort of um, linked into so many other things and networked into so many other things. And I think that came through very, very much in the questions that everybody asked. Um, but it also, I think, is very exciting because it means there's a lot more uh, that we can learn and, and do. And I, I hope that this book will be helpful to people who are trying to do just that. So anyway, thank you to everyone for coming and for all those great questions. Well, thank you very much. Can I just ask um, the editors about one practical question is, do uh, you have any idea whether there will be a paperback edition of it so people can, if they want to buy it, or is that on the cards yet? There isn't a paperback edition of it yet, is there? No, oh, okay. Well, hopefully, hopefully before too long. Anyway, um, it's going to take me some time before I get used to this format, uh, Zoom, and um, hopefully by the time I get used to it, we'll be out of this uh, pandemic. Uh, but who knows? But it's been lovely to imagine you all out there. Uh, and it's been very nice to see the, my fellow panelists. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for, for taking part in this, uh, in this seminar. And I urge you to um, get hold of a copy, whether it's paperback, uh, hardback, or, or whether you borrow it from the library. It's, it's a very rich source uh, to tap into. That's what I was left with having read it. Uh, and very fertile for ideas. And be perhaps particularly useful for those of you who are thinking of, of setting out on some kind of uh, larger research project and focus at peacekeeping to get insights from it. So thank you all very, very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.